Potter and the Goblet of Fire, Chapter 11, Aboard the Hogwarts Express. There was a definite end of holidays gloom in the air when Harry awoke next morning. Heavy rain was still splattering against the window as he got dressed in jeans and a sweatshirt. They would change into their school robes on the Hogwarts Express. He, Ron, Fred and George had just reached the first floor landing on their way down to breakfast when Mrs Weasley approached at the foot of the stairs, looking harassed. Arthur! She called up the stairs. Arthur! Urgent message from the Ministry! Harry flattened himself against the wall as Mr Weasley came clattering past with his robes on back to front and hurtled out of sight when Harry and the others entered the kitchen. They saw Mrs Weasley rummaging anxiously in the dresser drawers. I got a quill here somewhere, and Mr Weasley... So I got a quill here somewhere, and Mr Weasley bending over the fire talking to... Harry shut his eyes hard and opened them again to make sure that they were working properly. Amos Diggory's head was sitting in the middle of the flames like a large bearded egg. It was talking very fast, completely unperturbed by the sparks flying around it. And the flames licking its ears. Muggle neighbours heard bangings and shouting, so they went and called those, what you call them, please men. Arthur, you've got to get over here. Now, Arthur, you've got to get over there. Now, Arthur, you've got to get over there. Here said Mrs Weasley breathlessly, pushing a piece of parchment and a bottle of ink and a crumpled quill into Mr Weasley's hands. It's a real stroke of luck I heard about it, said Mr Diggory said. I had to come into the office early to send a couple of owls and I, and I found the improper use of magic lot all setting off. If Rita Skeeter gets hold of this one, Arthur... What does Mad Eye say happened? asked Mr. Weasley, unscrewing the ink bottle, loading up his quill, and preparing to take notes. Mr. Diggory's head rolled its eyes. Says he's heard an intruder in his yard. Says they were creeping towards the house, but they were ambushed by his dustbins. What did the dustbins do? asked Mr. Weasley, scribbling frantically. Made one hell of a noise and fire rubbish everywhere, as far as I can tell, said Mr. Diggory. Apparently one of them was still rocketing around when the please men turned up. Mr. Weasley groaned. And what about the intruder? Arthur, you know, mad eye, said Mr. Diggory's head, rolling his eyes again. Someone creeping into his yard at the dead of night? More likely there's a very shell-shocked cat wandering around somewhere, covered in potato peelings. But let the improper use of magic lock get their hands on mad eye. He's had it. Think of his record. We got to get him off on a minor charge. Something in your department. What are exploding dustbins worth? Might be a caution, said Mr. Weasley, still writing very fast. His brow furrowed. (coughs) 
Mad Eye didn't use his wand. If Mad Eye didn't use his wand, he didn't actually attack anyone. I'll bet he leapt out of bed and started jinxing everything he could reach through the window, said Mr. Diggory. But they'll have a job proving it. There aren't any casualties. Right, I'm off, said Mr. We Mr. Weasley said, and he stuffed the parchment with his notes on it into his pocket and dashed out of the kitchen again. Mr. Diggory's head looked around at Mrs. Weasley. Sorry about this, Molly, it said, more calmly, bothering you so early and everything. But Arthur's the only one who can get Mad-Eye off, and Mad-Eye's supposed to be starting his new job today. Why he had to choose last night? Never mind, Amos, said Mrs. Diggory. Sure you won't have a bit of toast or anything before you go? Oh, go on then, said Mr. Diggory. Mrs. Weasley took a piece of buttered toast from a stack on the kitchen table. Put it into the fire <laughs> tongs and transferred it into Mr. Diggory's mouth. Thanks, he said in a muffled voice, and then, with a small pop, he vanished. Harry could hear Mr. Weasley calling hurry goodbyes to Bill, Charlie, Percy and the girls. Within five minutes, he was back in the kitchen, his robes on the right way now, dragging a comb through his hair. I better hurry. You have a good turn, boys, said Mr. Weasley to Harry, Ron and the twins, dragging a cloak over his shoulders and preparing to disapparate. Molly, are you going to be all right taking the kids to King's Cross? Of course I will, she said. You just look after Mad-Eye, we'll be fine. As Mr. Weasley vanished, Bill and Charlie entered the kitchen. Did someone say Mad-Eye? Bill asked. What's he been up to now? He says someone tried to break into his house last night, said Mrs. Weasley. Mad-Eye Moody said George thoughtfully, spreading marmalade on his toast. Isn't he that nutter? Your father thinks very highly of Mad-Eye Moody, said Mrs. Weasley sternly. Yeah, well, Dad collects plugs, doesn't he? said Fred quietly as Mrs. Weasley left the room. Birds of a feather. Moody was a great wizard in his time, said Bill. He's an old friend of Dumbledore's, isn't he? said Charlie. Dumbledore's not what you'd call normal, though, is he? said Fred. I mean, I know he's a genius and everything. Who is Mad-Eye? asked Harry. He's retired. Used to work at the Ministry, said Charlie. I met him once when Dad took me into work with him. He was an aura. One of the best. A dark wizard catcher, he added, seeing Harry's blank look. Half the cells in Azkaban are full because of him. He made himself loads of enemies, but though the, uh, the families of people he caught mainly, and I heard he's been getting really paranoid in his old age, doesn't trust anyone anymore, Says dark, sees dark wizards everywhere. Bill and Charlie decided to come and see everyone off at King's Cross Station. But Percy, apologising most profusely, said that he really needed to get to work. I just can't justify taking more time off at the moment, he told them. Mr Crouch is really starting to rely on me. Yeah, you know what, Percy, said George seriously. I reckon he'll know your name soon. Mrs. Weasley had braved the telephone in the village post office to order the three ordinary muggled taxis to take them into London. Arthur tried to borrow ministry cars for us, Mrs. Weasley whispered to Harry as they stood in the rain-washed yard watching the taxi drivers 
heaving six heavy Hogwarts trunks into their cars. But there weren't any to spare. Oh dear, they don't look happy, do they? Harry didn't like to tell Mrs Weasley that muggled taxi drivers rarely transported overexcited owls and pig widgeon was making an ear-splitting racket. Nor did it help that a number of Dr. Filibuster's fabulous no heat wet smart fireworks went off unexpectedly when Fred's trunk sprang open, causing the driver carrying it to yell with fright and pain as Crookshanks clawed his way up the man's leg. This journey, now the journey was uncomfortable, owing to the fact that they were jammed in the back of the taxis with their trunks. Crookshanks took quite a while to recover from the fireworks, and by the time they entered London, Harry, Ron and Hermione were all severely scratched. They were very relieved to get out at King's Cross even though the rain was coming down harder than ever, and they got soaked carrying their trunks across the busy road. And into the station. Harry was used to getting onto platform nine and three quarters by now. It was a simple matter of walking straight through the apparently solid barrier dividing platforms 9 and 10. The only tricky part was doing this in an unobtrusive way so as to avoid attracting muggle attention. They did it in groups today, Harry, Ron and Hermione, the most conspicuous as they were accompanied by Pickwidgeon and Crookshanks went first. They leaned casually against the barrier, chatting unconcernedly, and slid sideways through it. And as they did so, platform nine and three quarters materialised in front of them. The Hogwarts Express, a gleaming scarlet steam engine, was already there, clouds of steam billowing from it. Through which the many Hogwarts students and parents on the platform appeared like dark ghosts. Pig Widgeon became noisier than ever in response to the hooting of many owls through the mist. Harry, Ron and Hermione set off to find seats and were soon stowing their luggage in a compartment halfway along the train. Then they hopped back down onto the platform to say goodbye to Mrs Weasley, Bill and Charlie. I might be seeing you all sooner than you think, said Charlie, grinning, as he hugged Ginny goodbye. Why? said Fred keenly. You'll see, said Charlie. Just don't tell Percy I mentioned it. It's classified information until such time as the Ministry sees fit to release it, after all. Yeah, I sort of wish I was back at Hogwarts this year, said Bill hands in his pockets, looking almost wistfully at the train. Why? said George impatiently. You're going to have an interesting year, said Bill, his eyes twinkling. I might even get time off to come and watch a bit of it. A bit of what? said Ron. But at that moment the whistle blew and Mrs Weasley chivied them towards the train doors. Thanks for having us to stay, Mrs Weasley, said Hermione as they climbed on board, closed the door and leant out of the window to talk to her. Yeah, thanks for everything, Mrs Weasley. Oh, it was my pleasure, dears, said Mrs Weasley. I'd invite you for Christmas, but, well, I expect you're all going to be staying at Hogwarts. Uh, well, I expect you're all going to want to stay at Hogwarts, what with... One thing and another. Mum, said Ron irritably. What do you three know that we don't? You'll find out this evening, I expect, said Mrs Weasley, smiling. It's going to be very exciting. Mind you, I'm very glad they've changed the rules. 
What rules? Said Harry, Ron, Red and George together. I'm sure Professor Dumbledore will tell you. Now behave, won't you? Won't you, Fred? And you, George? The pistons hissed loudly, and the train began to move. Tell us what's happening at Hogwarts, bellowed Fred out of the window. And Mrs. Weasley, Bill and George, sorry, <laughs> as Mrs. Weasley, Bill and jo Charlie sped away from them. What rules are they changing? But Mrs. Weasley only smiled and waved. Before the train had rounded the corner, she, Bill and Charlie had disappeared. Harry, Ron and Hermione went back to their compartment. The thick rain splattering the windows made it very difficult to see out of them. Ron undid his trunk, pulled out his maroon dress robes, and flung them over Pickwidgeon's cage to muffle his hooting. Bagman wanted to tell us what's happening at Hogwarts, he said grumpily, sitting down next to Harry. At the World Cup, remember? But my own mother won't say. Wonder what... Shh! Hermione whispered suddenly, pressing her finger to her lips and pointing towards the compartment next to theirs. Harry and Ron listened and heard a familiar drawling voice drifting in through the open door. Father actually considered sending me to Durmstrang, rather than Hogwarts, you know. He knows the headmaster, you see. Well, you know his opinion of Dumbledore. The man's such a mudblood lover, and Durmstrang doesn't admit that sort of riff-raff. But Mother didn't like the idea of me going to school so far away. Father says Durmstrang takes a far more sensible line than Hogwarts about the dark arts. Durmstrang students actually learn them. Not just, defen not just the defense rubbish we do. Hermione got up, tiptoed to the compartment door and slid it shut, blocking out Malfoy's voice. So he thinks Durmstrang would have suited him, does he? She said angrily. I wish he had gone, then we wouldn't have to put up with him. Durmstrang's another wizarding school? Said Harry. Yes, said Hermione sniffily. And it's got a horrible reputation, according to an appraisal of magical education in Europe. It puts a lot of emphasis on the dark arts. I think I've heard of it said Ron vaguely. Where is it? What country? Well, nobody knows, do they? said Hermione, raising her eyebrows. Er, uh, why not? said Harry. There's traditionally been a lot of rivalry between all the magic schools, Durmstrang and Bobaton, Light to Conceal... Their whereabouts so nobody can steal their secrets, said Hermione matter-of-factly. Come off it, said Ron, starting to laugh. Durmstrang's got to be about the same size as Hogwarts. How are you going to hide a dirty great castle? But Hogwarts is hidden, said Hermione in surprise. Everyone knows that. Well, everyone who's read Hogwarts a history anyway. Just you then, said Ron. So go on. How'd you hide a place like Hogwarts? It's bewitched, said Hermione. If a muggle looks at it, all they see is a mouldering old ruin with a sign over the entrance saying, Danger, do not enter, unsafe. So Durmstrang will just look like... <laughs> So Durmstrang will just look like a ruin to an outsider too? Maybe, said Hermione, shrugging. Or it might have muggle-repelling charms on it, like the World Cup stadiums. And to keep foreign wizards from finding it, they'll have made it unplottable. Come again? Well, you can enchant a building so it's impossible to plot on a map, can't you? Uh, if you say so, said Harry. 
But I think Durmstrang must be somewhere in the far north, said Hermione thoughtfully. Somewhere very cold, because they've got fur caps as part of the uniforms. Ah, think of the possibilities, said Ron dreamily. Ah, think of the possibilities, said Ron dreamily. It would have been so easy to push Malfoy off a glacier and make it look like an accident. Shame his mother likes him. The rain became heavier and heavier as the train moved further north. The sky was so dark and the windows so steamy that the lanterns were lit by midday. The lunch trolley came rattling along the corridor and Harry bought a large stack of cauldron cakes for them to share. Several of their friends looked in on them as the afternoon progressed, including Seamus Finnegan, Dean Thomas and Neville Longbottom, a round-faced, extremely forgetful boy who had been brought up by his formidable witch of a grandmother. Seamus was still wearing his island rosette, some of its magic seemed to be wearing off now. It was still squeaking, Troy Mullet, Moran! But in a very feeble and exhausted sort of way, after half an hour or so, Hermione, growing tired of the endless Quidditch talk, buried herself once more in the Standard Book of Spells Grave 4 and started trying to learn a summoning charm. Neville listened jealously to the others' conversation as they relived the cup match. Gran didn't want to go, he said miserably. Wouldn't buy tickets. It sounded amazing, though. It was, said Ron. Look at this, Neville. He rummaged in his trunk up in the luggage rack and pulled out a miniature figure of Victor Crumb. The miniature figure of Victor Crumb. Oh, wow, said Neville enviously as Ron tipped Crumb onto his pudgy hand. We saw him right up close as well, said Ron. We were in the top box. For the first and last time in your life, Weasley, Draco Malfoy had appeared in the doorway. Behind him stood Crab and Goyle, his enormous thuggish cronies both of whom appeared to have grown at least a foot during the summer. Evidently, they had overheard the conversation through the compartment door, which Dean and Seamus had left ajar. Don't remember asking you to join us, Malfoy, said Harry coolly. Weasley, what is that? said Malfoy, pointing at Pickwidgeon's cage. A sleeve of Ron's dress robes was dangling from it, swaying in the motion of the train. The mouldy lace cuff, very obvious. Ron made to stuff the robes out of sight, but Malfoy was too quick for him. He seized the sleeve and pulled. Look at this! said Malfoy in ecstasy, holding up Ron's robes and showing Crab and Goyle. Weasley, you weren't thinking of wearing these, were you? I mean, they were... They were very fashionable in about 1890. Eat dung, Malfoy, said Ron. The same colour as the, as the dress robes, he just... as he snatched them back out of out of Malfoy's grip. Malfoy howled with derisive laughter. Crab and Goyle guffawed stupidly. So, going to enter Weasley, going to try and bring a bit of glory to the family name? There's money involved as well, you know. You'll be able to afford some decent robes if you want. What are you talking about, snapped Ron. Are you going to enter, Malfoy repeated. I suppose you will, Potter. You never miss a chance to show off, do you? 
Either explain what you're on about, or go away, Mount. Either explain what you're on about, or go away, Malfoy. Said Hermione testily over the top of the standard book of spells, Grade Four. A gleeful smile spread across Malfoy's pale face. Don't tell me you don't know," he said delightedly. "You've got a father and brother of the ministry, and you don't even know. My God, my father told me about it ages ago. Heard it from Cornelius Fudge, but then fathers always associated with the top people of the ministry. Maybe your father's too junior to know about it, Weasley. Yes." They probably don't talk about important stuff in front of him. Laughing once more, Malfoy beckoned to Crabbe and Goyle, and the three of them disappeared. Ron got to his feet and slammed the sliding compartment door so hard behind them that the glass shattered. Ron! said Hermione reproachfully, as she pulled out her wand, muttered, Repero! and the glass shards flew back into a single pane, and back into the door. Well, making it look like he knows everything and we don't, Ron snarled. Father's always associated with the top people of the ministry. Dad could have got a promotion any time. He just likes it where he is. Of course he does, said Hermione quietly. Don't let Malfoy get to you, Ron. Him? Get to me? As if, said Ron, picking up one of the remaining cauldron cakes and squashing it into a pulp. Ron's bad mood continued for the rest of the journey. He didn't talk much as they changed into their school robes and was still glowering or glowering when the Hogwarts Express slowed down at last, and finally stopped in the pitch darkness of Hogsmeade Station. As the train doors opened, there was a rumble of thunder overhead, Hermione bundled Crookshanks up in her cloak, and Ron left his dress robes over Pickwidgeon as they left the train. Heads bent and eyes narrowed against the downpour, the rain was now coming down so thick and fast that it was as though buckets of ice-cold water were being emptied repeatedly over their heads. Hi, Hagrid! Harry yelled, seeing a gigantic silhouette at the far end of the platform. All right, Harry! Hagrid bellowed back, waving. See you at the feast when we... <laughs> no. See you at the feast if we don't drown! First years traditionally reached Hogwarts Castle by sailing across the lake with Hagrid. Ooh, I wouldn't fancy crossing the lake in this weather, said Hermione fervently, shivering as they inched slowly along the dark platform with the rest of the crowd. A hundred horseless carriages were stood waiting for them outside the station. Harry, Ron, Hermione and Neville climbed gratefully into one of them. The door shut with a snap, and a few moments later, with a great lurch, the long procession of carriages was rumbling and splashing its way up the track towards Hogwarts Castle. And that was chapter 11 of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, guys. The next episode will be chapter 12, the Triwizard Tournament. Until then, see ya.